Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar and we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. All right, well, I would like to welcome everyone and thank everyone for joining us. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. So my name is Austin Sipiora. I'm a researcher here at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I'm also the co-coordinator for Tampa Bay Clean Cities Coalition, which is a U.S. Department of Energy designated Clean Cities Coalition, and we serve six counties here in West Central Florida. So I'd like to thank our partners, South Shore Clean Cities, Carmel Clay Schools, Florida Transportation Systems, and Bluebird for working to put together this informative, educational, and I hope a fun webinar today. Um, before we begin, I'd like to point your attention to the Q&A box and to please feel free to type in questions uh, for our speakers throughout the webinar. We'll have time to address questions um, in the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Next slide, please. So today we'll be hearing about funding considerations for Florida school districts, takeaways and lessons learned for integrating an electric bus program. We're also gonna feature a live virtual demonstration of the Bluebird Type C Vision Electric Bus. And we'll also close out with a Q&A session with our panelists. Next slide. So our speakers today include Alex Kolpikov. He serves as coordinator for Tampa Bay Clean Cities. We have Ryan Lissick, project manager for South Shore Clean Cities. Ron Ferrand, who is the director of facilities and transportation at Carmel Clay Schools in Indiana. We also have Chris Rustman, who is the president of Florida Transportation Systems. And Hinton Harrison, who is a mechanical engineer for Bluebird. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Alex. So in addition to leading Tampa Bay Clean Cities here at USF, he is also a senior research associate here at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the university. All right, Alex, turn it over to you. Thank you, Austin. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you can tell, the, the picture on uh, my picture of the previous slide was uh, taken before the uh, 
COVID-19 uh, quarantine. So uh, first I wanted to uh, uh, just briefly uh, give an overview of the uh, Clean Cities program in case uh, some people are not familiar with it. Uh, the Clean Cities program is the program within the uh, uh, US Department of Energy uh, Vehicle Technology Office. The primary goal of the uh, program is to uh, reduce uh, petroleum use in transportation. And uh, the Clean Cities program uh, focuses uh, mainly on uh, four uh, areas, uh, building local and national partnerships, providing uh, information and education, uh, offering technical problem solving assistance, and providing competitive uh, we awarded financial assistance uh, through grants to uh, support uh, R&D efforts. The technical assistance is uh, provided through the uh, technical response service that is uh, available to local coalitions to address the uh, uh, technology challenges. And as part of the uh, information and education piece, DOE provides a variety of tools, uh, resources, and uh, publications to support the uh, local decision making and uh, help identify technology gaps in the area of uh, alternative fuels. Now, there are about uh, 90 uh, local uh, coalitions across the United States. In fact, uh, about 82% of the uh, population in the United States uh, currently lives uh, within the uh, boundaries of the uh, Clean City Coalition. Uh, Florida has uh, four designated coalitions uh, and uh, Tampa Bay is one of those. Uh, we're a relatively young coalition. We were uh, officially designated in uh, 2014. Now, uh, I wanted to uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, just uh, doing a recap of uh, different uh, funding options available for funding uh, alternative fuel uh, uh, school buses, and in particular electric uh, school buses. Now, uh, Florida the Department of Environmental Protection oversees the uh, diesel emission uh, mitigation program, which is, uh, uh, handles the VW settlement uh, funds. And in October of 2019, uh, DEP published the Beneficiary Mitigation Plan, which allocates 70% uh, of uh, funding to uh, school transit and shuttle buses. About 15% uh, of the funding goes to, uh, to the uh, electric vehicle uh, charging infrastructure, and another 15% goes to the uh, DIRA uh, projects. And at the end of uh, 2019, uh, DEP uh, made uh, $5 million available for the initial phase of uh, uh, replacing uh, the school buses with the electric buses. And uh, so far, they haven't announced the winners of that uh, solicitation yet, but we're looking forward to uh, hearing about the announcement soon. Uh, also in February of this year, uh, DEP also posted a grant funding opportunity for the level three EV charging infrastructure uh, for the uh, first round of that funding. And recently, uh, DEP also announced the uh, uh, winners of that uh, that uh, first round of funding, and we are very excited about that. We believe that this may uh, be a sign for potential subsequent RFAs uh, that may include also the school buses as well. Uh, uh, also, I would like to uh, encourage you to uh, connect with the uh, uh, your Queen Cities Coalition in, in your area to uh, get information about different uh, available funding uh, in, in your area and because the coalitions uh, often uh, keep the, their stakeholders uh, engaged and informed about different opportunities and uh, sometimes uh, can even uh, provide assistance with uh, preparing and applying for certain grants. Uh, I'm sure uh, many people on the call here are familiar with the uh, EPA uh, DIRA uh, program. So it's the uh, diesel emission uh, reduction uh, uh, program that uh, is uh, handled by the uh, Environmental Protection uh, Agency. And, uh, the, the 2019 DIRA uh, school bus rebate uh, provided uh, the funding for replacing old uh, buses with the, uh, uh, the new ones. And uh, that particular program provided from 15 to $20,000 per bus for uh, replacing older buses with the newer ones, including the uh, uh, alternative fuel buses. Now, some of the information about the eligibility of that program is on the slide. I'm not gonna read all of that. I uh, just wanted to mention that uh, that uh, program in 2019 provided overall uh, 10 million in funding for replacement of uh, diesel school buses. And uh, as you explore um, opportunities for funding uh, the electric buses, I would recommend uh, get engaging the uh, local utilities to make uh, them aware of uh, some of the plans that, uh, that you have 
and it's uh, it's really uh, important for the utilities to uh, know about uh, uh, various uh, potential infrastructure replicate uh, infrastructure requirements that uh, you may have in uh, increasing the uh, electric vehicle fleet. Great, thank you, Alex. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Ryan Lissick serves as project manager for South Shore Clean Cities, one of our sister coalitions, which is headquartered in St. John, Indiana. Um, he's been associated with the DOE Clean Cities program since 2015. Um, Ryan's Clean Cities management duties span from overseeing the Green Fleet programs for two metropolitan planning organizations and also serving as a technical resource. His expertise spans from financial, project management, energy, transportation, and emission reduction. All right, Ryan, feel free to take it from here. All right, thank you, Austin and Alex. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we had a pretty good uh, representation of about uh, clean studies in general from Alex, and I'm not gonna get into that so much. Um, like uh, Austin had said, we are a sister coalition and this is a time unlike any other with an opportunity for, uh, I would call the trip tipping point for electric vehicles and cleaner emissions. And um, just a little background about South Shore Clean Cities. Uh, we were designated the 71st Clean Cities Coalition back in June 25th of 1999. And uh, just like our sister Clean Cities, there's a Clean Cities in your neck of the woods across the country. So please feel free to reach out to them if you have any other questions. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. So the Indiana Green Fleet Program. Now, well, this is Indiana. We're talking about Florida here. This program gets fleets ready for the different funding opportunities that are available. And so we work with over 170 fleets in our area. And the goal is to uh, basically let them know how their fleet is operating and, and how can we reduce emissions, reduce costs, how can we include some grant opportunities outside of their organization to clean up or improve their fleet. And so the whole reason why we're doing this is to uh, displace our dependence on foreign petroleum. Um, and so with that, uh, we're looking across the board at many different fleets, but school buses are definitely a need in every community that we're working with. And we have had a lot of success with schools and their transition to alternative fuels. And um, uh, what we're gonna be talking about here is the first electric school bus in Indiana. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. So how does our Green Fleet program work? What we're looking for is to provide educational opportunities and different uh, technological workshops to get people in fleet uh, owners acclimated and educated. And there's we do it from recognition and certification from our multiple uh, marketing standpoints, um, we have different branding and promotional tools that we help out in, with the certification status of our Green Fleet program. And we have the experts from outside of our organization with our vendors that know just exactly everything there is to know, just like our Bluebird people that are going to be on here later as well. And then, like I said before, this is a, uh, we look for funding assistance with grant opportunities and different federal incentive programs. And at the end of the day, we provide a 30 page report uh, based upon your current operations. Next slide, please. And so the Green Fleet audits in general, and this is gonna be the exact information that you're gonna need to uh, utilize in order to develop a grant application. Annual fuel usage, annual miles and hours used, total number of vehicles and equipment, um, fuel type, average vehicle and equipment life, downtime for fueling and maintenance and fuel cost. Next slide, please. And then we put it all into a report that makes sense for from a fleet operations and 
uh, perspective so that you can make those decisions and analyze those costs, those emissions in order to improve your fleet. And luckily with everything that has gone on at Carmel Clay, I have to say we have an expert in Ron Farron in the pupil transportation industry. He is someone that probably could tell you VIN numbers off the top of his head about some of his buses in his fleet. So when we're looking at this and we're implementing electric uh, compared to new diesel, propane across the board, this is something that we looked at and provided him just a what it looks like over the total cost of ownership for uh, the school buses in Indiana, you have to have them for 12 years and what that looks like. And so we sat down with him and this was really an opportunity for them to look at all electric and introducing into their fleet, which uh, you'll hear about more. Um, next slide, please. So our process in looking at the electric bus, and like I said, uh, Ron Farron is, an, is definitely a world-pound uh, pupil transportation fleet, and with energy, it takes the right route for the, these buses. You're naming them to football games or championships 300 miles away, for example. Um, you want to make sure that that bus is a shorter is a shorter route, and that's what um, we identified over at Carmel Clay is where is the best route suited, and can we fit enough students on that 84 passenger Type D bus? Um, know the bus specs. So what's the range? What's the capacity? What's the charging time? And work with the experts. So the experts in in our neck of the woods. We have a Cummins drivetrain on these Bluebird buses. Our Bluebird dealer in Indiana is McAllister Transportation, and they are wonderful, and they were more than, um, more than capable of providing all the information needed in order to make a decision for the electric bus. The charging station, you have to know what type of plug is gonna be going on to these buses, and what type of plug do you need to connect? It's not a, as simple as a gasoline or diesel dispenser anymore. You have to make sure that it's uh, coordinating together. Um, location is extremely important of uh, where these charging stations are going to be going. In Indiana, we have snow, so it gets cold. That affects the battery capacities and overall efficiencies. So that was something that came into play in order to keep the life of the bus we looked at DC fast charging versus level two and some of the costs that are associated with it. Um, ultimately, level two was chosen. And when you look at the operations of a school bus, there's a lot of times where that bus is sitting around. So it's a perfect opportunity to charge it in eight hours overnight and it's gonna be charged and ready to go in the morning. Um, some of the implementation, storage again, looking at the different uh, battery storage and analyzing, uh, again, how, what's the range on that and how long is it gonna take charge. Fleet telematics, being able to compare it to your other buses within your fleet from a, an efficiency standpoint, from a fuel cost standpoint. Um, and then working with uh, the different electricians that are available. And we looked at a couple of different manufacturers and. Ultimately, they end up, uh, Car McLean ended up going with uh, Clipper Creek CS100s, and they utilize their own electricians to um, implement the station, construct the station, so they were able to save on costs there. And as I said before, the partnerships in this were monumental because this is the first one in our state. You, there's not a lot that you can't go down the road and see what school A is doing. You have to this is a, a pilot program for the state and being able to connect with world renowned companies such as Cummins Bluebird. That's really where the, the rubber meets the road in the implementation of this and having that boots on the ground support from McAllister transportation and to provide the training, being able to go down to Cummins and view the buses, test drive the buses. That was really, um, crucial to the success of this project and as it's continually uh, linked to success. 
uh, next prop, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the timeline, how did this all start? So May 2nd, 2019, that's uh, when I first met Mr. Farron and we started working on the grant package. They were running propane um, and with the Volkswagen settlement, he's looking at type D buses. He needs those 84 passenger buses that, um, that can run on uh, alternative fuels. So we weren't looking at propane, we were looking at all electric and that's where kind of the opportunity came. We we're able to submit the grant on June 17th of last year, July 23rd, we had the award notification and the very next day, you have to start prepping in order for the delivery of that bus to make sure that everything's going to go right in order to make sure um, exactly on what is needed in order to support that bus. So from then on until the bus was delivered, it's making sure that the drivers are trained, the mechanics are trained, and that it's going, which route is it going on, and uh, making sure that the infrastructure is in place. So May 7th, that bus was delivered in, in beautiful Carmel, Indiana at Carmel Clay. Uh, June 24th, we co-hosted uh, the ribbon cutting with Bluebird and Carmel Clay. We had about 50 individuals there from across uh, all of the different industries in the area, but there was a lot of school admin, the Cummins was there, local Bluebird, McAllister reps were there. And it was a success. You have to celebrate these things being the first in Indiana. That's a huge monumental and people don't think of Indiana as uh, uh, innovative, but there's a lot of good things that are coming on in Indiana. And as we said, there's more than corn in Indiana. Uh, right now in the process, we're, I just got the, uh, the documentation back from the scrapyard. So with Volkswagen Selman, you have to give up a bus. And so we put, some, put a hole in the engine block, cut the frame rails, and we have to submit for reimbursement. Uh, the next slide, please. So like I said, this has all the different partnerships in this in order to make a successful relationship. And looking across, this is a win-win-win for the community, for the students. Everyone wants to see uh, better uh, missions for our most uh, crucial cargo. cargo. And uh, that's what it really comes down to is reaching out and looking locally who can be supportive in these projects and make sure because it's more than just a delivery of the bus on the first day. This bus has to be around for 12 years. So being able to, to provide sustainable project leadership, that's really what Carmel Clay brings to the table and especially Ron Farron, I can't say enough good things about him. Next slide, please. So when should you get started? Now, getting ready for a grant is kind of like having a baby. There's never a good time to have a baby. You have to get ready for it now. Reach out to your local Clean Cities organization. Connect with your local uh, Bluebird dealer. Become self-educated what else is going on across the states. Learn about electric infrastructure. You can always certainly reach out to me and I'll provide you anything from the uh, AFDC and the DOE uh, publications and become that green champion that's the most important thing is you have that ownership of a project of this kind of magnitude at uh and luckily enough we were able to work with ron Farron. he is definitely our green champion now be ready before that rfp goes out have budgets ready have the routes ready look at what is the criteria that is important for that grant application and make sure that you have everything down pat because when that RFP comes out, you only have a couple, a couple of months to put it together. So um, can't stress that enough, be ready. All right, that's pretty much all I have for today. And I have a contact information on the back there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Ryan, for sharing about uh, the great work that South Shore does and really for emphasizing how important partnerships are to support these types of initiatives, you know, especially since, you know, we in Florida are navigating new territory. Um, you know, those partnerships are really key. So next up, I'd like to welcome Ron Farrand.
Ron is the Director of Facilities and Transportation for Caramel Clay Schools in Carmel, Indiana. He has been involved in school facilities and transportation management for over 20 years. Ron has overseen the bus replacement for Carmel Schools during this time and has also been directly involved with both the planning and acquisition of alternative fuel buses. Ron has been really instrumental in obtaining several grants for the purchase of propane field buses and most recently guided the effort and support of the purchase of Indiana's first all-electric school bus. All right, Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as, our, as you've heard, we're located in, Car in Carmel, Indiana. We're just on the north side of Indianapolis. Um, our district is about just a little, is just over 16,000 students. Um, and uh, we're uh, one high school. Next slide. Um, well, I'll backtrack a little bit. This just kind of gives you a background of what kind of things I'm in charge of. But in terms of the transportation, the big key piece is the bus replacement planning. Um, I think Ryan mentioned that Indiana wants us to keep our buses for about 12 years. So we um, have a plan that we have to present every year that shows five years of that 12 year plan. Um, so it's uh, uh, constantly renewing at least a, some number of our buses. Next slide. Uh, just to give you a little more flavor of our school corporation, as I said, we're, uh, we have 15 schools that we're servicing with our buses. Um, we cover a district that's about 60 square miles and uh, we have one high school and three middle schools and 11 elementary schools. Uh, next. And then our fleet is 188 buses total. Uh, normally we would have around 170 to 70, 172 buses on the road. Uh, last year or so with the driver shortage that most of school transportation operations are experiencing, we've had to make some extra effort to save routes and, and double up. Generally speaking, we're a two tier system. We have uh, our buses run an elementary route and a secondary route, uh, either middle school or high school. And so for a year or so, we've been having to run an extra route in there occasionally to get everybody to school. Uh, we, as you see, we're traveling over a million and a half miles a year. And, um, and then uh, Ryan alluded to the fact that we have the have LPG buses. We're up to 24 now out of that fleet. And then now we've added the electric bus. Next. This gives you a little shot of how, what our uh, statistics are for student transportation. Um, most of our fleet is rear engine transits. Um, we usually are running either 81 or 84 rated passengers. Um, and right now with the COVID situation, we're only putting two to a seat. Um, and so our capacity is even further reduced, although uh, we have uh, a lot of our, about 20 or 25 percent of our students have elected to do virtual learning for the time being. And our secondary schools are alternating half the students every other day. So it has helped us out a little bit in that respect, um, in spite of the other difficulty that's created. Uh, next slide. And so we, uh, as Ryan indicated, we went to work as soon as we heard about the grant for the electric bus. Um, we're pretty excited about it. We've, we've had good community support for our programs with the alternative flus. In fact, a lot of these slides come from an annual presentation that I do to a group of community people, about 20 or 30. Uh, we've done it for, I don't know, several years now. And it's a different group each year and they see all aspects of the school corporation and one of the th and I had to make a presentation about facilities and transportation and I usually do make a, a special note about the um, alternative fuel buses that we've been purchasing and and that usually generates a lot of interest it's it's an important factor for the community our city government has been doing a lot of uh, alternative fuel vehicles in their fleet especially in their uh, passenger car fleet and police their police vehicle fleet. 
So the community uh, has a high expectation in that respect. Um, the particular bus that we got, uh, we worked real hard to be the first one. So we're real happy about that. <laughs> and uh, we uh, have a route that we're planning on. It'd be running about 40 to 45 miles a day. Um, our population is pretty dense, so it doesn't take us long to get in and out and do a route. Um, so we're, uh, we'll be well within the mileage range of the bus and for charging purposes. Uh, we actually will have two charging stations. One will be in the bus lot with all the, the rest of the fleet um, where it will be parked most of the time. And so they'll be able to plug it in, uh, if not between routes, certainly overnight. And so we'll have plenty of time to keep it charged. And a daily route, we should be able to run both our morning and afternoon without charging it. Um, we don't anticipate using it on any long trips. It could be used around town. Um, although in talking with uh, some of the partners that are like our electric supplier and some other folks, you could actually plan your route and find charging stations along the way if you wanted to do that. Uh, we, we know we can do the same thing with our propane buses. The, they'll prearrange stops for you to, to recharge or refill. Um, so we all have two charging stations, as I indicated. Our charging station in the uh, bus lot will have a uh, reporting device that will connect back to our building with, through Wi-Fi that will be able to monitor the power consumption so we can compare with our electric rates what, what our expenditures are for power and thus the fuel uh, comparison to diesel. Uh, at the same time that we bought this bus, we bought several other type D diesel buses. So we'll be able to make a direct comparison to identical bus of the same model year um, for the duration of our ownership and be able to report that back to the VW settlement uh, committee uh, for the duration of the grant cycle that we're a part of um, for the award uh, requirements. We've done the same, we did the same thing with some of our propane buses when we first bought some of those we were able to we had identical di diesels that we were able to make a direct comparison to. So we're really looking forward to it. We think it's got some real, it has some real interest besides the one route that we'll use it on primarily. We do plan to uh, use it here and there occasionally just to get some other exposure around the district. Um, we did make one comment to folks that they will, this is one time they'll have to be on time to the bus stop because they won't be able to hear it coming. <laughs> it is a very quiet bus. Um, but I do want to say the next slide. Um, thank you to all of our partners. Uh, McAllister was very helpful and instrumental in getting us information to put together the proposal with Ryan at South Shore, and and our school administration has been very supportive of the of the project along the way. And last slide. And then, as Ryan said, we did have a community event uh, attended by our school board. Our mayor was there and, ad and addressed the group. Uh, we had numerous people from other agencies in the city and the state. Um, and so it was a pretty good chance to have great exposure for what we're doing here and, and having the chance to have this bus in our fleet. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ron, for sharing your unique insight and perspective as a school district who recently went through the process and also for being that green champion leader for Carmel. So before I turn things over to our next speaker, I'd like to mention that we are very excited to have Bluebird here with us. They're going to be doing a live demonstration of the bus and equipment. Um, because this is a live demonstration, I just ask for your patience in case we encounter any technical difficulties and I hope you all enjoy the demo. So with that, I'd like to introduce Chris Rustman. Chris Rustman is the president of Florida Transportation Systems, and he also serves on the steering committee for Tampa Bay Clean Cities Coalition. We're lucky to have him. Florida Transportation Systems services as Florida's authorized dealer for Bluebird buses and also other vendors. All right, Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Austin. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, thank you, uh, 
uh, Ryan and Ron as well for going through some of the background on getting that, that first bus for Indiana. Um, much, much like the excitement I can hear from you guys being able to deploy the first unit, uh, the first unit and being that green champion, we are very anxious to have that uh, similar experience down here. And we're, we're on the cusp of it uh, any day now. Um, but hopefully what, what everyone is getting a sense of as we go through this is that th this is not the, the typical bus purchase process or acquisition process as, as the diesel unit of, of yours. You're not sitting at your desk filling out a PO and just, you know, uh, business as usual. Uh, this process, getting into uh, electric bus deployment here, you have to involve many stakeholders and partners um, from, like the, the gentleman before me said, from rounding maintenance, uh, administration, local clean cities coalitions, uh, you know, any willing partners for grant assistance, even even dealers uh, are, are hyper involved in this process as well to make sure we're not uh, over anticipating anything that can't be delivered. But um, one of the most important reasons for all that focus and all that collaboration is that we're working with a unique bus here, and uh, I, I may preempt the question that we'll get at the end, but for Florida users, we, we may be looking at a, a $220,000 Type A unit. Um, the, the Type C and D units like uh, Ron and Rex were, were mentioning for Indiana there in Florida, we're probably going to be 330000 and up, depending on, on how each individual district specs those units. So, uh, again, a very uh, an expensive unit on the front side. There's lots of grant opportunities and all that to, to assist with funding, but the good thing is, uh, nobody's going to be first to, to do this now. We've got some other partners that we can learn from and collaborate with and, and take it from there. Um, and if you could, Alex, next slide. Uh, another good partner to obviously have for consideration is going to be your, your OEM bus manufacturer. And, and for us with Bluebird, uh, we have no better partner. Bluebird's been in business since 1927. Uh, to date, we have delivered well over 600,000 vehicles uh, since then. Um, next slide as well. Uh, what, one thing that also makes Bluebird unique in the, in the pupil transportation industry is going to be their dedication to the all fuel segment. Um, I, I heard mention earlier of the propane deployments in Indiana. We're, we're keenly uh, familiar with all that down here in Florida as well. Uh, Bluebird has put over 14,000 propane units on the road in a very short amount of time. Uh, the balance of their other all-fuel units are, are uh, CNG units, uh, gasoline units, and, and EV units as well. Uh, next slide, Alex. And, and as we mentioned, having uh, good partners with, uh, with, with your deployment and, and with your acquisition, uh, Bluebird has one of the best partners when it comes to the, the EV vehicle that we're going to see here in a second, and that's Cummins. Um, as, uh, as Ron and, and Ryan both mentioned as well, Cummins is... Uh, there to support us. They're there to support you as the as the end user. And we couldn't really ask for for a better partner in the electrification of this vehicle. Um, next slide, Alex. Now Austin prepped all this, and this is the first time we're trying to do a, a live demo through uh, through the joy of Zoom. So please have some patience. Uh, quick reminder as well: please switch your view to gallery if you could. That will help us get the uh, the video of the bus and the screen properly. And again, thank you all for your for your time here. I'm going to hand this off to uh, Hinton Harrison with Bluebird. He's a mechanical engineer at Bluebird. He's been there for over the last 20 years. He's been involved in a wide variety of chassis designs for both domestic and imported buses. Uh, he's had the joy of working with manual transmissions, multiple fuel systems, and had key roles in developing products that have helped Bluebird stay an industry leader in the school bus market. Uh, when concepts were being developed for this electric bus, Hinton was the part of the initial design team and then moved into the training role to help us uh, better hand these off to end users for, for their appreciation and, and usage. Uh, with all that, Hinton, we appreciate you and uh, best of luck on the floor, sir. Well, thank you and good afternoon to everyone. What we have here is a, a work in process chassis. Uh, that's going to be an electric bus, but we wanted to show this today uh, without the body on it because this is the way you can see all of the good electrical uh, components that make an electric bus go. So what we're going to start with is the electric motor. This is a Dana TM4, a Sumo six-phase AC motor. It is rated at 315 horsepower and 2,400 foot-pounds of torque. 
The reason we have so much torque is what makes Bluebird a little bit unique is that we do not have a transmission in our bus. This space here is going to be just a drive shaft between the motor and the rear axle. And we did that for two reasons. One is we tried to keep the maintenance down on our electric bus as much as possible. And two, weight is a nemesis to an electric vehicle. So every chance we got where we could cut some weight out, we did, so we picked the motor that did not require transmission. So when you put this motor in drive, it goes forward. And then when you put it in reverse, the signals come and it reverses the rotation of the motor and you go in reverse. And this black box that you see over here are quite a few high voltage uh, components in order to make this uh, motor operate. So the batteries store electricity in DC format. So we have to convert it to AC. So in the bottom of this box is the inverter that converts that DC to six phase AC current. We also have three AC chargers uh, on this bus, and we're going to get back into the charging in just a little bit, but there are three AC chargers on this bus. There are also two DC to DC converters, and what that does is it gives you the equivalent of a 400 amp alternator. So we still have 12 volt items on this bus. You still have your interior lights, your headlights, uh, your warning lights, and, and quite a bit of the control system use 12 volts. So we have to be able to keep the 12 volt battery charged by back, uh, back up. Also inside is a distribution box. So it, it's like a common junction point for uh, the cables coming from the batteries. And then from that junction point, it goes to the variety of accessories such as the air compressor, and you'll see some more up front like the steering uh, motor. Also in this area, we have the uh, air compressor. So in order for air brakes to operate, you have to have an air compressor. And since we don't have an engine of any sort to turn in the compressor, we have a 380 volt uh, motor uh, that's turning a 14 cubic foot compressor uh, only when the, the system demands it. So this doesn't run all the time like it does on an engine. So when the pressure drops, it's controlled by the governor, which is the same governor as on all other uh, Bluebird air brake buses. This motor comes on, the system uh, comes up, it turns the compressor on, and when the pressure is high enough, it turns itself off. Now, like compressors on engine, it has to have a lubrication system, but we don't have an engine to get that oil from. It has its own lubrication system. So you have a dipstick here, and you also have an oil filter uh, that has to be changed roughly once a year. You have your air dryers. It has the same air dryers uh, options that all the other uh, Bluebird uh, air brake systems have. So this just happens to be an, an ADIP. You can also get an AD9, uh, depending on what your school district likes to, to use. Now right here, we have just recently moved to a different charging plug. This is what's called a CCS1, a Combined Charging System Level 1. We have moved from the, what we did use, which was the uh, SAE1772 plug, so now we're using this plug where it can handle both AC charging and DC charging. So with every bus coming forward, you'll have the ability to charge with AC or DC current. So if you want to charge with just AC current, you'll use the top portion of the plug, and it looks very similar to the other level two, and it will go in here. And you'll be able to charge a bus if you just happen to get lucky and back it up to the charger right when the batteries were fully depleted. It would take somewhere between eight and eight and a half hours to fully charge at 19.2 kilowatts uh, an hour. If you go to DC fast charging, or you'll hear some of us say DCFC, you will use the entire plug, and that your DC current will then go through these bottom two pins, and we'll use the communication ports up here at a maximum of 60 kilowatts an hour. And that will allow you to charge a bus in roughly three hours. Moving on up to the frame rails, 
in between the axles are our 14 batteries. And that's what you see here, these aluminum block looking pieces. Those are our batteries. There are two sets of seven. And each seven has roughly 620 nominal volts inside. So they're broken into two sets of seven so that if for any reason one battery happens to go down and the telematics turns one battery off, you still have another whole set of seven in order to get yourself back up. You'll still have full power. You'll still have a full acceleration. But what happens is that your range will get cut in half. So you must be mindful of what the dash is telling you just in case your batteries uh, develop a problem. But that's why it was divided into two sets because we didn't want one battery of the 14 and uh, to completely shut the bus down. In this area where the batteries are caved is the same material that we use around our diesel and propane fuel barriers uh, in order for crash resistance. So, this, so in the uh, inevitable event of a, of a side impact, we have the batteries protected with the same metal as what our diesel and propane tanks are protected with. Now, up front on a conventional, and, and let me just stop for a second, the, the, the parts that we have on this bus are the exact same parts that we have on our rear engine bus. They're just mounted in a little bit different spot. So to start with, the radiator on a conventional bus is up front, uh, where on a rear engine we'll be mounted to the rear, but it's the same part. We use a, a propane radiator, uh, uh, controlled the cooling with four fans, and we do that with four fans in order to control how much electricity goes to it. Because we don't need one fan running all the time. So depending on how much current needs or how much cooling needs to be done, we either have zero fans, two fans, or four fans running. Uh, also up in this area, we have a low voltage uh, module. Because again, you still have to have 12 volts uh, for quite a few of the control circuits. We have a power steering uh, pump over here that is run off of a four kilowatt motor. Once you get to that pump and the oil gets out of that, it's the exact same steering system that all other Bluebirds have. It's the same reservoir, the same oil, the same gear. And we did a lot of this in the pre-planning part is that we didn't want the maintenance to be too terribly different uh, than what you already have on your, uh, on your diesel or propane bus. We also have a thermal management system in here. And what that does is it controls uh, the temperature of the batteries. Uh, if, if you're in a cold weather area, it will heat the batteries so that they will take a charge. If you're more of a warmer climate, there is a chiller on here that's basically just a small air conditioner, and it will send cool fluid to the batteries in order so they will charge uh, at its maximum capacity. So now what we're going to do, now that we've seen the major parts, we're going to go into a completed bus. We're going to go through the start cycle so everybody can hear what an electric bus sounds like. So approaching the bus and to the driver's area, it looks very similar to what we already have on any other bus. But to start it, the dash is just a little bit different. So all you're going to do is you're going to take your key, you're going to turn your key uh, to the on position, and the dash is going to come up. Uh, the center portion, it'll say initialization complete. You will give the key just one quick turn to its detent, and you will see where it says vehicle enabled, and now the bus is ready to go. And what we're going to do is just give a little uh, second, and you can hear the comment that was made about how quiet this bus is. So to further make this bus operational, we built two interlocks into this bus because it was so quiet. So the first thing that you have to do on every Bluebird electric bus is that you have to engage your seatbelt. What this does is it's, we're hoping that nobody's going to cheat this system, but it forces a driver to be in the driver's seat. 
We also make it so that you cannot put it in gear, be it uh, drive or reverse, until the service door is closed. So without the service door closed and without the seat belt on, there's no possible way to go to drive or reverse. Okay. So when we were to do that, and if we were to disengage our parking brake with either the door open, we would get messages here that says that you have not uh, satisfied all the interlocks and there was no way that we would be able to get the drive. Then to shut it off, we'll just go to neutral, set your parking brake, and you just turn the key off. And we don't want to restart it again until the parking indicator has gone out. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Hinton. Great, so um, again, thank you to Hinton and Bluebird for that opportunity to virtually experience the vision model. And we do have about 12 minutes left in our hour for questions for our panelists. So just a reminder to please put in some questions in our Q&A box. And we've actually had a few already come in, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, Chris, maybe you can talk a little bit more about this. Can you talk specifically on the cost for the electric bus models in Florida? Uh, certainly, and, and hope you guys can hear me okay there. Um, now, bear in mind that the Florida units are going to be different than, than any other state, just on our base specs and, and some of the items we include. Uh, actually, just this year, we, we have stability control as standard on our buses, so we're, we're adding new uh, technology and features on an annual basis here. But um, for us, we have, uh, and Bluebird has three different electric vehicles available through the Department of Education contract, uh, as well as some other contracts. But uh, the Type A unit, which is commonly referred to as the, uh, the cutaway style bus, uh, that smaller unit is going to be about $230,000 uh, on, on various contracts. Uh, the Type C and the Type D bus, the larger bus like Kenton just demonstrated there and, and the rear engine model, those are going to start at about three hundred and thirty thousand, and and your price will then increase or or stay static based on on local options. If you need uh, additional heaters, if you need air conditioning units, if you uh, a number of districts in Florida are opting for three point seats now, little, little things like that will add and increase that price point. Um, but that's basically where where the vehicle does come in on a on an initial price point. Uh, with VW, when we see some some plans roll out on that, uh, I, I believe the intentions are for electric specifically. That infrastructure is something that could be a reimbursable expense. So hopefully, uh, at least in that regard, that's something that perhaps VW will also uh, the mitigation fund will also assist us with as far as reimbursement metrics for uh, for the end user. But hopefully, that that answers that question. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Um, Hinton, we have a question for you. Can you talk a little bit about how quiet is the bus when it's on the road and if there are any safety sounds for hard of hearing and or blind pedestrians? Yes, the whole point of the electric bus was it, it was very quiet. You don't have an engine, you don't have an exhaust, and it, it, it created some challenges for people on the sidewalk or even for the bus approaching uh, a stop. So what we did is, is inside the grill here is we have mounted what's called a noise generator and this noise generator will come on when the bus is doing less than 18 miles an hour uh, and when it approaches the stop and as you get slower it gets noisier and but it will turn itself off uh, if you apply the parking brake then once you have completed your stop and you start speeding up and you get above 18 miles an hour then this noise slowly fades out as you're moving on down the road. Great, thank you. Uh, another one for you, Hinton. Can you talk about the bus's air conditioning system, what type it is, 
And what would you project the effect would be on bus range when the AC is operating, considering how important AC is for us here in Florida? Okay, so right now we are we have one air conditioner uh, option, and it's a roof mounted. Uh, we are working on a second one in which the condensers and evaporators uh, will be skirt mounted, and then inside of the bus also. Uh, those air conditioners do work off of, especially the, the rooftop one, works off of the high voltage system. So they're at 620 volts. Uh, the one on the roof uh, works with the 403C uh, refrigerant. So we, we use that so it's higher pressure, more efficient, uh, better cooling with less electricity. What we have seen on range uh, with air conditioners that if, if the driver decides that, that if he needs to have have it pretty cool on the inside and, and he runs an air conditioner for the full route, we're noticing about a 20% reduction uh, in range uh, with air conditioners. Great, thank you. Um, Ron, we have several questions coming for you, so maybe we'll, we'll tackle one at a time. Um, what would you say to another school transportation director who may be interested in introducing electric buses but isn't sure on where to start? Well, after having gone through the process, I'd say if you have access to uh, Clean Cities uh, affiliate, I'd start there. Um, probably the company that drove it the hard for us at the beginning, though, was our Bluebird uh, company, McAllister's. Uh, they came to me right off the bat when the announcements were made about the settlement fund availability and, and what could be applied for. And so we uh, got and got looking at it with them initially, and then and they actually um, introduced me to Ryan to get him involved, and 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 Ryan was great at stepping in and really took charge of the of the application process, which was extremely helpful. Great. And can you talk a little bit about how school bus drivers have responded to the electric buses? Um, if they had any preconceived notions, how different is that from how it actually is in the field? Um, well, I can't answer a lot, some of that because uh, we, we got our bus after we all went home for uh, the virus concerns. So they haven't been exposed to it too much. We, they certainly have seen those that have come and gone in the meantime have seen it and, if, and, um, and we've, uh, you know, you know, they've been around it. I think we've even taken a few of them for a ride around the bus lot. Um, and I think they're excited about it. Um, we're really looking forward to having uh, the driver that will eventually drive it get on it and get used to it. Um, they've been pretty receptive to our program to introduce the alternative fuels buses, alternative fuel buses. And I think they'll find this one, the uniqueness of it is just, is the exciting part, I think. And, and we've taken, we've made a big deal about it. So I think they're, they'll pick up on that and be representative of that and as they drive it around in, in the community. Excellent. Uh, one last question for you. Um, did the grant uh, pay for the electric bus also include the charging infrastructure? For us, it did not. We made that part of our contribution. Um, we so and uh, it really it wasn't terribly expensive. I don't remember offhand, but it, I was pretty surprised. I think it was it was by far the least expensive thing of the of of all. And um, so, but no, we made that part of our contribution to the overall uh, grant application. Great, um, Hinton. A couple additional questions for you: Is solar charging feasible uh, for the future of the Bluebird fleet? With the solar technology that we have right now, it is not feasible right now to put solar panels on top of the bus. Uh, the voltage uh, that comes out of a solar panel uh, is very low. It's right around 22 to 30 uh, volts. Uh, even if you change that voltage and just go to a small amount of amperage and you up the voltage, the issue is that you're trying to take voltage from a solar panel and push it into a battery system that's operating between 620 and 700 volts. So with that type of potential pushing backwards, a, a solar panel isn't gonna work on the bus. Where solar comes in 
uh, and becomes effective for electric buses is with a solar farm. So with that solar farm, it would charge batteries. It would have the batteries at a higher potential than what the batteries are on the bus. And then you can recharge your electric bus uh, from the batteries that get its source from the sun. Great, thanks for that clarification. Um, also, Hinton, was there a mention of managed charging during the demo? And uh, what is the most popular range found with the buses? Okay, let's, let's split that up into two answers. Mm -hmm. So managed charging, uh, the bus that we manufacture does not have managed charging. We go through that with our uh, charging or EVSE or electric vehicle supply equipment uh, suppliers, uh, such as Nuvi. Uh, they have software uh, that is view as attached with either a LAN, uh, Ethernet, or wireless. Uh, you can control the charging rate uh, through the EVSE and not so much uh, through the bus. And that can be done with both uh, AC and DC charging. Uh, as for effective range, uh, what we're seeing uh, with this bus uh, used on a school bus route, and, and, and we're not going to pick extreme areas such as the northeast or uh, uh, places in the deep south. Uh, we're seeing right around uh, 90 to 100 miles um, as a school bus. When you start getting into these extreme temperatures, uh, like New England, uh, where you're really running the heaters or you go down into the Miami-Dade area where they're going to need air conditioners quite often, uh, we see that drop down into the, the low to mid-80s. Right. We had a question come in, if you could address um, supercapacitor technology and how that might apply. I cannot speak to that uh, right now. Uh, we've had very, very little uh, conversation about supercapacitors. Uh, right now, well, we are just sticking with, uh, with battery uh, technology uh, using lithium ion uh, in, for inside of those batteries. Um, all right, I think we, we got time for maybe one more. Again, it would be great if you could close this out and talk a little bit about the process for ordering and receiving an electric school bus. And Chris, this might um, you know, we might also want to hear from you on this, if you can talk in general about that in terms okay, of timeline like and the process. That, uh, I would like to divert that question to Chris, if, if I could, please. Uh, he, he works with uh, the dealership. He's closer with the customers than, than I would be as an engineer. No, ha happy to work with you on that. And and really, it's going to come down to when, when a customer is ready at the, at the point we have determined these are the specifications, these are, these are the options that the customer would like on the unit. Uh, ordering the unit is going to be very similar to like every other Department of Education order we have placed uh, for the last several years. Uh, it's our anticipation and, and expectation that we will also deliver all these units within the same timelines as our Department of Education contracts. So we're looking at a, a six to eight month turnaround time on delivery. Uh, I will throw a little disclaimer on there because I don't know what coronavirus will throw us uh, yesterday, today or tomorrow. But, um, you know, pending any supplier issues or anything like that, we should be able to, to exist in that six to eight month turnaround time. But uh, um, again, I don't think it's going to be too complicated of a process, and, and I, I hope it's not intimidating to hear all the different uh, factors and things you need to consider, but it's, uh, um, it's something we're here to help any way we can. Great. Well, we are just past 4 o'clock. Um, for any remaining questions that come up, we'll ask that our speakers address those, and we'll send them out in a follow-up email along with a link to the recording of our webinar today. Um, so on behalf of myself and Alex, I'd like to thank Ryan, Ron, Chris, and Hinton, as well as the other folks at South Shore, Conwell Clay, FTS, and Bluebird for a great webinar today. Um, I hope everyone was really able to take away some valuable points and lessons learned out of this. So everyone take care, stay safe, and thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.